We're joined by two guests today who are going to talk about the wattle and why it deserves its own day and more besides. Maria Hitchcock is known as the Wattle Lady, which is a nickname that tells you everything you need to know. She's responsible for the Gazette of Australia's National Floral Emblem and National Wattle Day. She published a book called Wattle. Uh, good morning, Maria. Good morning. And Tim Entwistle, any time we go to Matters Botanical, we need you here in the Blueprint for Living studio. Very good to have you here. Maria, I am going to kick off with you. What is it about the wattle that makes it such an iconic flower? The whole concept of using wattle as a national symbol goes back over 100 years, right back to, in fact, the colony of Van Diemen's Land and uh, Hobart Town in 1838. The settlers there decided that they wanted to have a symbol of their new land and uh, they chose the silver wattle at that stage. Why did they fixate on it? Did it particularly stand out? I think so. I think, the remember, many of them came from Britain and uh, to them Australia was a rather bleak sort of a place. The colours of the bush are more olive grey and an olivey green colour and suddenly we have this blaze of yellow in the bush and I think that it was such an amazing experience for them that they fixated on the wattle as being a, a symbol of this new land. So coming up September 1st is Wattle Day. Tell us what Wattle Day is and why. Well, Wattle Day was originally supposed to be the first day of spring. And we go back well over 100 years to the 1890s, uh, to Adelaide. A number of people there who belong to the Australian Natives Association, they wanted to have a celebration of spring in Australia, similar to what was being done in England, Europe, and they felt that uh, the 1st of September would be the Australian version. And unfortunately, their uh, progress was impeded by the First World War and it didn't really take off again until I started my campaign in 1986. And, and Maria, I do recall that there was a period between the two wars when that day did move back a month to the 1st of August as well. I, I agree with you about that iconic status of Wattle. And I think the other thing that impresses people is everyone can have access to it. Wasn't that also that, that thing about it being almost egalitarian, the fact that anyone can grow a Wattle, anyone can get a piece of Wattle, and that was part of that early feeling as well? Absolutely. It's a really interesting thing. I think Australians are very pragmatic people. Even though they have one particular wattle, the Cater Picnantha, as their emblem, it doesn't really matter whichever wattle you use, uh, you know, to celebrate with whatever comes to hand. And, of course, there are over a thousand species of wattle in Australia, and so there's wattle blooming, you know, all through the year. The thing about the August the 1st date, in the uh, first... First World War, the most common wattle in gardens at that time was the Cootamundra wattle. It was sort of like a cult plant and everyone had a Cootamundra wattle. And um, the Red Cross asked people to bring in sprigs of wattle so that they could sell them for the war effort. And in fact, the sprigs of wattle were then dried and bound with little purple bows and sent across to soldiers in France and on the front, Egypt and so on. And people, you know, were saying, saying, oh, but our wattle is finished by the 1st of September. So they had a lot of trouble just sourcing the wattle. It was different in Melbourne where people went off into the bush and there was lots of wattle out in bloom on the 1st of September. But in Sydney, it was a problem. So the Red Cross asked if the Wattle Day League would be happy to change the date to the 1st of August so that they would have lots of sprigs of wattle. And when the war ended, the date seemed to continue the 1st of August so it was never official and uh, it was carried on in schools and I've had many debates with people who said oh but Wattle Day is August the 1st you know I remember it at school and and yes that's perfectly correct. You're right you're right Maria there's that great debate isn't there whenever you talk to anyone there's a yep. they don't know which date I mean my my view is though that you're quite right about Cootamundra's flowering early and they're, they're all over the place they're even a bit weedy but in Melbourne now we're just going through our peak wattle season it's started late July and, I th and certainly around Sydney the same. So 
One of the arguments I'd use for the 1st of August, which I, I have to put on the table now as my favourite, as you know, but that, that's because that's when most of the wattles really start. As you said, wattles are in flower all through the year. You'll always find one. There's this real peak, though, and if you go to any of the gardens like, say, Mount Annan's Botanic Garden, the Australian Garden out of Sydney, there are more wattles in flower right through August. And I find it's when people start to notice that something has happened. It's when the, you know, and I call it an early spring called Sprinter in Australia, but that early spring really starts and be great, I think, to start that with Wattle Day as an Australian day. Tim, how do you take the the point Maria makes about uh, the kind of malleable definition of wattle being useful for this, making it a democratising thing? Do you think we're too imprecise when we celebrate the wattle in this country or uh, is that imprecision a strength? Well, it's now much more precise in one sense and it's probably not quite what you're getting at, but the, the wattles actually grow around the world or a case you used to grow in South Africa and Australia and South America and recently we've had to divide that genus up and, and because they're, they're all they're a little bit unrelated, in fact. They're, they're in different parts of the family tree. So the Australian acacias are now quite distinct those are thousand species. It is a very democratic plant. It grows all around Australia. There's always one in flower somewhere. Uh, what, what's interesting too is one of the early debates in in Sydney, particularly, was this: the waratah or the tilopia was being argued, as, as Maria would well know, as one of the the plants that people thought could represent Australia. But you know, it, it doesn't really grow everywhere. One of the interesting things, Maria, you might comment on this too: the golden wattle, in fact, is very Victorian, South Australian, and Southern. New South Wales. So it's it's not quite as democratic as perhaps we might uh, perceive, is it? No, but I think, Tim, you have to go back into history and realise why it was selected. And, and I have to point out to everyone that I didn't choose anything. All I did was a little bit of Commonwealth housekeeping. So the emblem itself was uh, selected way back in the 1890s. And the reason it was selected was because of the tanning industry. Mm. Um, Acacia Pycnantha has... Um, very good tanning properties in the bark and Australia was going through a depression and they saw the tanning industry as bringing them out of that depression by uh, bringing in a lot of income and so interestingly the emblem was chosen not only for its beauty but also because of its economic properties and it's very hard to choose one particular plant isn't it? I mean, you could argue about the mulga or, you know, many other Australian wattles as being perhaps more universal. Maria, I love, though, that the the version of it that was on the coat of arms back in 1932 was a stylized wattle, a kind of generic uber wattle rather than any specific genus. Is that right? Absolutely. And if you have a very close look at some of the uh, the little balls, they're blue. So <laughs> it's a very stylized <laughs> version. That definitely deserves the dubious phrase uber wattle, which Absolutely. is, is going to be my new uh, nickname. So clearly Tim's fight is not with you and with Wattle Day, it's with Australian seasons altogether that makes it a, yeah, oh, look, a it bigger is, battle. It is. And, and look, I, I love what you've done in bringing the wattle in, you know, as you say, you've formalised history in a sense with the flower. The, the gazetting of Wattle Day in 1992 really meant that we had Wattle Day and for that there's a big tick. What I'd love to do is the fact, and you mentioned it's based on the start of spring and this kind of and a spring that we brought to Australia, perhaps that very first Wattle Day in 1838 in Hobart would have been very much, you know, celebrating almost a European uh, a spring. I think in Australia, though, our seasons are a bit different. Certainly um, up, up where you are, living in the north and where I am in Melbourne, the spring to me starts earlier. So what I'd love to do is celebrate those different seasons, so an early spring with a wattle day that started on the 1st of August. Even if historically it's gone back and forth, um, you know, I think it's time to perhaps take control and, and put it back there. <laughs> the almighty Australian wattle wars continue. Maria Hitchcock, the wattle lady, and Tim Entwistle, director of the Royal Botanic Gardens, Victoria, thank you both for joining us this morning. Thank you. Pleasure.